Okay, so this um, uh, talk is going to draw information from two background papers for a uh, report on aging in East Asia that is coming out um, uh, from the East Asia Department and the, the development group at the bank uh, in the next few months. Um, and also from uh, a couple of specific papers with colleagues from, from Beijing University. Um, so the, the challenge of population aging in, uh, in East Asia and in other countries would span research in macro, micro, international, public sector, health, and labor economics. Um, this particular work is going to uh, be based on um, more micro level uh, questions and, and it, again, is really descriptive in nature, but is in uh, looking at uh, evidence from health and retirement uh, survey type surveys and other household surveys in East Asia. Now, so there are sort of twin policy objectives that may be important in East Asia with respect to older workers and the aging population. And the objectives sometimes uh, con may conflict with each other. The first is the, the problem of, of finding a way to protect elderly from the risk of poverty in old age, um, and uh, at this, which, which may mean developing uh, social pension systems or ways of essentially providing and extending some type of, of minimum support to uh, elderly who worked in agriculture or in the informal sector. And then on the other hand, to encourage and facilitate longer working lives for elderly who have been, or for older workers who have been in the formal sector and have faced relatively generous uh, pension systems and relatively early uh, retirement ages. So, um, these two, uh, in a sense, there are two retirement systems that we see, you know, most starkly in China, but across East Asia, in which you can think of a formal retirement system to which civil servants and formal sector workers are going to rely primarily on pensions in old age as their main source of support, and then an informal uh, retirement system which is the, uh, the, the mostly retirees or uh, farmers who are still working who are in small-scale enterprises in agriculture, who tend to live, when they can no longer work themselves, tend to live off savings and family support. Um, so with population aging, right, burdens can rise both fiscal burdens for the formal sector and strain on families in the informal sector. In addition, there's a question we've been asked quite a bit as to how much the migration of young adults uh, to urban areas in China, to, ur to, to Bangkok, to urban areas in Vietnam, out of rural areas in Indonesia, is affecting support, uh, both financial and instrumental support for the rural elderly. So, you know, the policy solutions might be to provide some type of uh, support for the informal sector workers, uh, but at the same time trying to find ways of raising the effective retirement age or reducing disincentives for retirement for uh, more formal sector workers. So, across uh, EAP, there's across the bank jargon, I should correct myself, across many countries in the East Asia and Pacific region, we continue to see uh, what look like uh, are con considerable income poverty rates among the rural elderly. Um, so China is the purple dotted line here. And this is, again, looking at the per capita uh, poverty in households where elderly are residing, we make no effort to um, determine whether or not you're feeding grandma and whether or not an allocation of resources within the household. Um, 
so you know, we might ask ourselves, one, what's the, will, will introducing social pensions or some type of uh, government subsidized pension reduce poverty without crowding out private support um, and distorting labor supply decisions? Um, you know, even first, ahead of that, what is the case for some type of pension covering the informal sector? Is there risk of falling into poverty? Much of the region has been growing very fast. Growth, may, growth and family support may be sufficient to ensure uh, 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 well-being in old age you know, if the Confucian system is still, is still functioning and working. Um, and for some, uh, well-being in old age requires continued employment. Second, there are concerns if we were to turn, in the China case, from rural to urban China and the formal sector in urban China, you may be concerned over uh, too much early retirement. Right? So with population aging, we may worry about rising support ratios uh, with demographic change, um, exacerbated by early retirement. And we might want to think about what factors are contributing to earlier retirement in order to facilitate longer working lives, whether uh, uh, raising levels of skills or changing uh, policy or uh, institutions. So in much of East Asia, you know, so uh, financial and in-kind transfers uh, and co-residence with adult children uh, reduce vulnerability to poverty. What's interesting if we see in some countries the re in the region, in China and Thailand, as with Korea earlier, we see fairly sharp declines in co-residence patterns. Um, in uh, you know, Korea, in some sense, is the future on co-residence for China and Thailand. But over the last 20 years in Thailand and China, we also see uh, fairly sharp declines in co-residence uh, with adult children at older ages. Interestingly, the, in China, you see a hump at ages below 60 where there's increasing co-residence, but we would think this is likely driven by real estate prices, right? And that the implicit transfer from co-residence is not going from uh, ch adult child to parent, but this reflects adult children uh, who are continuing to live longer with parents. Um. So, John, do you, sorry, do you have that for urban and rural? You know, I, 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 I do somewhere. Um, you should take it on faith that a lot of the hump is driven more by urban than rural. Right. So child care is important, and we'll look at, uh, We'll look at the, uh, there, there's some evidence in China that providing childcare for uh, grandchildren affects the labor supply of older women. But um, let, I'm going to come to that in a, a little bit. So, you know, first we, we might think of a simple accounting exercise. Um, and again, this, this ignores behavioral responses. But just looking at what someone's income poverty rates would be before and after public and private transfers suggests that uh, private transfers continue to be very important in um, uh, keeping the elderly out of poverty. You know, so the, the top uh, line in all of these figures is the income without any other transfers. Um, what we see is that in, in uh, Thailand and Vietnam, as well as Korea, private transfers, and China, of course, private transfers continue to be very important um, in just a, a simple, almost accounting, naive accounting sense in reducing the probability that you would be in poverty. Right? So the top line assumes that there would be no labor supply or other response to losing all uh, all transfers and suggest much higher rates of, uh, of, of possible poverty. 
public transfers are far more important in Thailand where there is um, a social pension that's been in place for uh, rural residents over age 60. So we look at a, um, looking, we look next at how well uh, private transfers respond to low income uh, in a sense of how well they're keeping elderly out of poverty. We're going to look at pov uh, partial linear models that are going to allow for, um, in a sense, um, we're, we're going to be agnostic of what the motives for transfer are, whether they're exchange-based or bequest motive or, or, or um, altruistic. Uh, but allow for, for differences at different points of the income distribution. And we'll look at both responsiveness uh, at different points in the income distribution um, and, and just, just asking ourselves, do we think that um, any type of new public transfer is likely to crowd out private transfers? Um, and we, this, we present dis descriptive evidence here on differences for households that have migrant uh, and non-migrant adult children. Um, again, asking ourselves if there are distinct differences in patterns of transfers, of financial transfers. And one of the, the things we see in country after country is that financial transfers are considerably higher for uh, households that have migrant adult children. So the, the pre-transfer income is shown on the x-axis. On the y-axis, x-axis, we show the, the predicted per capita uh, transfer, that uh, financial transfer into the household. And this um, diagonal line uh, represents uh, falling below the poverty line. So this is going to suggest that in China, at very low levels of income, you're at risk of being in poverty in rural areas, uh, regardless of whether you have uh, migrant children or not. But on, on average, uh, older people with, um, with uh, migrant children are receiving more financial transfers from the family. There's, there's, it, it's not, there's not obvious evidence of systematic elderly abandonment. In Indonesia, uh, the uh, transfers are, um, uh, the, the difference in expected transfers are higher, and even more so in Thailand. In Thailand, again, the pre-transfer income includes the, the pension income, and uh, there, there, there isn't as much evidence of poverty among the elderly. All right, so if we were to look at the transfer derivative, where a negative one would suggest that a, an additional yuan of income would crowd, out, uh, would crowd out the financial transfer going into the household. And again, we know this is, this is simply descriptive, uh, we make no attempt to, um, to look at labor supply responses or any other behavioral responses. There's not a lot of evidence in China and Indonesia that uh, a, 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 a transfer into the household would, would be crowding out um, private transfers. So uh, if we were to look at the other covariates in this regression, I'm just going to to summarize them for you. Um, we observe poverty among the elderly, but we also see in the, the linear part of the partial linear model that the transfers are increasing in years of education of adult children, in the number of adult children. So declining family size is associated with, uh, uh, with uh, a, a reduction in transfer, but this is roughly compensated for by the, the, the increase in, in transfers associated with more productive children. Now, of course, in the future, there could be general equilibrium effects. There could, I mean, this, 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 this is, this is uh, purely descriptive. Um, so again, but 
the, the transition to a smaller family size may suggest reducer, reduced transfers, but the higher quality children seem to more than compensate for the decline in, in family size. So um, in, in, in some, there seems to be you know, some case that a, a, uh, a, a pension, a social pension or subsidized uh, pension could uh, contribute to reducing risk of poverty, um, but that you know, family, within family transfers are continuing to play a very important role. Um, so in thinking about labor supply, uh, so, and thinking about retirement in the informal sector, we might ask ourselves whether new pensions will create disincentives for work and what the um, relationship is between uh, pension receipt and other household characteristics and work, uh, and work uh, in the more formal sector. So you know, we want to distinguish between administrative and economic retirement. You know, so in, when one starts talking about retirement in China, people think, uh, and, and in a lot of places, they think about the, the, the processing of retirement. Do you go in and file your, pages, your, your papers at what age to stop working um, and to leave your current employer and uh, secure a pension? We think about retirement as the decision to stop all work, um, to, to, to essentially uh, become economically inactive, right? And so in, uh, again, the, the sharpest example is China. Um, but throughout the region, mandatory retirement of employees in civil service and mandatory processing of retirement for the civil service and formal sector workers creates a fairly strong bias against work at older ages. There uh, tend to be relatively generous pensions. And we can see this in the timing of retirement in, uh, in uh, China between urban and rural areas. We tend to see retirement jumping at uh, mandatory retirement ages of 50 for blue collar women, 55 uh, for white collar women, and, and age 60 for men. Um, again, this is, and if we were to contrast the retirement hazards for, uh, this is from a retrospective question on, on retirement age of people who've currently uh, stopped working, um, you see sharp spikes at the mandatory retirement ages in among the urban population, but a, a smooth exit from work among rural residents. Yeah. How is retirement measured for rural population in China? How it's how you. It's how long uh, you've worked in the last year, right? So there's some. This is consistent with with new work we're doing with ILO for how to measure informal work and agricultural work. So, so, so it's so uh, have you worked? It's a measure of actual work. Have you put it, that's right. Have you worked for, you know, in the recall period, one thing you might worry about is that the recall period is longer because we want to deal with uh, seasonality. And, but it was, you know, 10 days or more in the last year rather than one hour of work in the last week, which is the, um, in, in the discussions of changing measurements of work status, um, there's been some discussion of using higher frequency surveys in developing countries and trying to, to deal with seasonality this way. But an alternative response is to ask, have you worked? My, my, I'm, I'm worried that it's a more, your measure is more a measure of health or disability or, or rather than... Because well, it's very hard for uh, peasants to know what is what, what is not, especially if they have uh, plots, uh, vegetable plots. Well, so Sure, and I, you know, I have. Um, so we also have reported hours of work conditional on working, and what you'll see, uh, I believe, in a couple. If there's no labor 
uh, activities it might be a sign of, of age or, or disability. Well, we'll also, I'm also going to present those statistics to you from Charles. Um, but it's uh, you know conditional on working. The hours are not. It's not like my father and mother-in-law working in the garden plot for 15 hours a week. It's more like 50 or 60 hours a week. So it's it's not like. And, and certainly, exit from work is strongly associated with health status as and disability, which I'm I'm going to show you. So um, you know so. Across East Asia, the differences in patterns of labor supply in rural and urban areas are going to mirror differences in formalization of both employment and pension systems. Um, what is also um, uh, interesting is that labor supply in, say, East Asia's older workers tends to be much higher than uh, older workers in Europe. But this reflects higher incidence of informal employment and self-employment. And you know, an, an interesting difference in patterns is that in, in China, in Vietnam, Thailand, uh, to some extent Indonesia, highly educated people exit from work at young ages. Through much of the OECD, we tend to see a pattern of exit from work happening first among less educated people, right? And so because the informal employees, farmers, uh, are working until much, are, are, are also tend to be less educated and have less access to uh, social insurance, they also tend to be working much longer. So again, this just shows the, the differences and shares of urban and rural workers uh, receiving a pension. And you, know, you could look at the, the exit from work as going to sort of mirror these, these uh, patterns. Across the region, rural residents continue to work at uh, older ages than, um, than uh, urban residents. So you know, China is not that different from uh, what we see in both Korea or Indonesia. Um, and, you know, and again, in developing East Asia, individuals with higher education tend to retire earlier, which is very different from what we see in Eastern Europe and, and Central Asia, where there are, you know, like with the United States, it's relatively easy to, to, to get a disability pension that allows you to to stop work at a relatively young age. So I'm going to show you correlates of the retirement decision. And again, this, this first set of results I want to show you aren't in any sense uh, uh, identified. But we assume that the labor supply is driven by a need for income, which may be uh, affected by access to a pension or wealth, a capacity for work, which is health status. Um, you know, opportunity cost of time in other alternative non-market uses. So this may be taking care of relatives over, of, of older relatives or of children. Um, in general, in, in urban areas, households are wealthier. Many people have pension income and retire at a relatively early age. In rural areas, households tend to be poorer and fewer elderly have a, a pension or a generous pension. Um, we look at whether you know, the relationship between own health status is measured through uh, activities of daily living and, and instrumental activities of daily living. And then uh, preferences for uh, retirement, joint retirement at the same age. So whether or not a spouse is, is continuing to work. So uh, not surprisingly, we see pension receipts strongly associated with exit from work in urban China and Indonesia. Uh, we see this as uh, less, um, uh, th there's less of a relationship in Japan and Korea. Uh, Korea's pension system uh, involves a defined contribution and has not been around in, in 
it for, for very long, it's not particularly generous. A lot of old people may, older people may not be able to afford to retire. Um, in Japan, uh, there seem to be less, um, there's, there seems to be more self-employment and other types of activities am, among older people at uh, beyond retirement age. So, Much of this is built in to the rules. I mean, there are a lot of rules yep. that say you can only collect a pension if you don't work. Right. And, and others allow people to work, right? Well, so in... Multiple, so you may either work on in the same job or other jobs. So there's a lot of... Fun. I, I haven't right, so, right, right, so... Right, right. Yeah, that's, that's fair enough. In China, in, in China, Indonesia... I don't believe Japan and Korea, I don't believe there's a penalty for working beyond uh, pension receipt. You're not, you're not fined, you're not, um, but, but uh, the, so the, there, isn't, there isn't this type of disincentive built into the institution, but they're fairly generous and the ability to have, the ability to find other work that you might want um, you know, our, our, our guess is that it's driven by uh, ability, you know, your reservation wage of work and a fairly generous pension. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, anyone here, but I, I, I don't believe, pardon? There's no work requirement. There's no work requirement, right. So, physical and instrumental functioning. Taxation uh, of pension income is the same as there's not a, I don't think it's, it's not treated differently. No. Um, yeah. One other point before you get to the development. You've been emphasizing lack of formal pension, but before you're talking about transfers. Right. So the question is, do you have data on exactly the nature of the transfers from the parents to the child, the child to the parents, or from third parties, other parts of the family? I mean, this presumably is the issue of the pension. Social security systems more generally is whether or not this is replacing. Right. You, you were hinting at that earlier. Right. There's no, there's no, um, you know, so in the, the China, Indonesia, Korea, Japan data sources, we know who the, uh, who's, we know who the parents are transferring to. We know who the, ch we know the children's transfers to the parents and other family members. I think as, uh, as Yushia was saying, the, the, the predominant uh, transfer is from parents, between parents and children. Though the, you know, and what I showed you, the transfers I showed you were the net transfers, the net financial transfers. But over the um, life cycle, at a later age, the flow the other way. Yeah, the later age is the flow is from children to, children to parents. Right. The, the urban, I'm just wondering what the magnitude is. Is, it, is the pension system that it's urban, 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 entirely different. I understand. Urban, urban, very, very little upward. Um, mostly 2,000. We have a, I'm going to um, show you results from an RD of uh, because Because urban parents have house and children don't have house. Right, so there's, there's an implicit transfer in, through the living arrangement um, at younger ages, and then in, inheritance. I mean, it, it, there's a there's a the implicit transfer of the living arrangement is is towards the children. But, uh, this is at a younger age. Right? This yeah. is about doubling up to older ages. But, right. care. but the rural is puzzles me all day. That you seem to suggest that there is a pension in rural China. Yes. The new rural, uh, I, you know, so the, if I get to it, I'm going to show you some results from that, which will suggest that the effect of that pension on, on, on transfers is quite low, and there's maybe a modest effect on labor supply, a modest negative effect on labor the supply. Very it's, it's very small. The, the, rural, the rural pension is about, would, would bring you up to about a third of the poverty line. But it provides some, it provides nonetheless some insurance. So to answer Jim's question, one institutional factor is that the law regulates that children, adult children, are financially responsible yeah. for the economic well-being of your elderly. 
this so is for, this. So those pensioners, they don't meet children. Right. The rurals, they entirely, the burden is on their children. Right. And there is, there is, this is, is actually in China's family law. And over the last 15 years, there have been efforts to even strengthen the ability to punish children that don't support their uh, parents. But then yet another thing to do is that the generosity of the state benefits. Right. So even if there were no transfers from parents, a child to parents, they cannot live. Uh, for well, the would they get, well, they wouldn't live, they wouldn't get any kind of housing or fuel or, yeah, yeah. I thought even in rural China, there were basic subsidies for housing and fuel. I don't think there's not, not anymore. There's a minimum living standard program. Right. Right. Though you could, you know, it's community-based targeting, and so if you, if you had children who were migrants that your neighbors felt were affluent and could support you, you might still not be able to get access to the poverty assistance. So, you know. Those levels are so low. Yeah, they are. One, so one reaction to the descriptive information that I presented to you that I think is valid is that we've looked at vulnerability to poverty, but that's a pretty low threshold. And you might, you know, looking at transfers at and, and, and vulnerability to you know, even twice the poverty line might be, might be relevant. Um, you know, there may be more crowding out at, at that point. But um, let, let me. Officially, the, the minimum living standards are actually bringing up to the poverty line. But in practice, if you measure consumption poverty in rural areas, among other leagues, in the Charles Baseline, you find the poverty rate is 22%. Um, so it's obviously not working to eliminate the poverty rate. The, the new rural pension actually expanded very much recently, since 2009. The current year rate is quite high now. But the benefit is the cover rate is the it's like a fifty five R and B per month. So yeah. that's really little money. That's not enough to buy rice to yeah. eat to One live. Right. Yeah. So it it's the coverage rate by two thousand thirteen is pretty in the two thousand thirteen data it's pretty it's almost all counties, right? Yeah, all yeah, but it's pretty complete. Um, so we don't we don't find a strong we find some uh, relationship between childcare responsibilities or the existence of a grandchild either in the household or or nearby as being uh, negatively associated with women's labor supply um, in China, but it's not a strong relationship. Um, uh, the correlation between husband and wife's working status is, is uh, very high. And in, in China and Vietnam, this would suggest that raising women's age of, of benefit receipt or raising women's uh, retirement age may also lead to in increased labor force participation of men. Um, there's some work out of uh, UCL looking at exogenous changes in women's retirement age in, in the UK that uh, suggests that uh, this, might, um, this might be one effect. Um, we also look at whether or not there's gradual retirement, so conditional on working, how many hours uh, a week are you working. Um, in, in Japan and Korea, we see some evidence, we see evidence of, of gradual retirement um, and also in, in form, the informal agricultural sector, but that it's happening at much later ages. People who work tend to work a lot of hours. You know, so looking at the correlates of, of employment, so pension receipt in, in, in China is very strongly correlated with exit from work. And again, this isn't driven by uh, taxation of income, uh, differences in, in tax treatment of income or uh, eligibility for pension if you consider, continue to work. It's, it's just fairly generous. The decision can be made um, 
early and often is. So, you know, there's off, of course, there's often a joint decision here about taking a pension and, and exiting from, from work. Um, the activities of daily living uh, score is whether or not you're, you're um, unable, uh, it's a z-score of a count number of activities you're unable to, physical functioning activities you're unable to perform, and the IADL is the, the ac instrumental activities of daily living, you know, can you uh, cook for yourself, can you shop, can you uh, manage the household budget, um, and this is, there's a fairly strong relationship between disability and, and work in both rural and urban areas, and, but particularly um, a stronger effect in, in, in rural areas. Uh, in terms of women's labor supply, so if there's a young child either in the house, like a grandchild, either in the house or in the, the, the neighborhood um, from your family, you're somewhat less likely to work, but this isn't that strong. And there's a strong correlation between a spouse work status. These results are fairly similar in uh, Indonesia. Pension coverage is not as great, um, but the relationship between physical functioning and work is also uh, fairly strong. Um, and you know, I just want to highlight that in, in Korea and Japan, uh, pension receipt doesn't seem to be statistically uh, significantly related to exit from work. Um, you know, so there are uh, women's uh, child care responsibilities as a much stronger, potential child care responsibilities as a much stronger uh, negative association. Um, and again, there's a high correlation spouse work status. So in Japan, similar, the old age pension is a pension you're, you're eligible for after age 65. The other social insurance benefits here would reflect disability insurance and other, other ways of getting access to support uh, before uh, retirement age, and there is a negative association there. Uh, also some association with, with health status. Can I ask a question? You're not quantifying the level of pension. Do you think right. these are like life cycle employment and labor supply decisions? Right. So it's not just you have a pension, but it's the magnitude of the pension. That's right. And then, you know, whatever disincentives there may be, there's a tax rate or some other pension feature. I'm just wondering if you quantify that for the work to quantify that across the agency. So to get an idea, like income and Right, right, right. Especially if the coverage of pension is almost universal, there's not much variation. Right, right. right. You know, whether they have it or not, in Japan that might be the case. In Korea, uh, that might be the case. In China, a large portion of them don't have a pension. Right. But it's the, you know, crossing the, cross, essentially the discrete move over the age threshold is. This is the problem. You don't know the pensions for the people who are still well, still working. Yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, so one of... Could you estimate from the Social Security system what the financial... Yeah, so the... Are, you know, I mean, if they're state pensions or if they're government agencies, you know, so we have to quantify what the budget set might be. Yeah, so it ends up... We have tried to... We've tried... So the, the, the issue we've, we run into with this, and we, we tried in, in Charles and... There's less effort, I think, in, in the other HRS surveys in the region to ask information that would get us to calculate this. But people, people's recollection of so how many years they've, how many years they've contributed to the particular uh, as a as a state sector worker or civil servant. Um, that, that not only is there. The, the sort of recollection of how long, it doesn't map perfectly well into how long you've been working because there were reforms of the pension system that happened at different stages. So you know, people's understanding, and correct me, Xiaoyan, if I'm wrong, but people's understanding of what their benefit is going to be is very hard to, 
to get information on. Right, but in the U.S., you can match people to their social security information. We don't have a similar ability to no, do that. Yeah. yeah. There are some idea what the benefits were, so you could right. at least project it. They may yeah. not know it, and that's another whole dimension here. But assuming they knew it, then you could use it. We we could do that. Yeah. It would probably be it would be worth doing. The rules were different. Well, so there's there's the, the, the sort of national level legislation, but with a lot of policies in China, there's a in, in each in each uh, there's a, a caveat that each region is allowed to apply this these general principles in the way that they see fit in consistent with local economic circumstances. You will go up. Well, you're, yeah, you're not, you're not teacher are, salaries. Not teacher salaries are directly So that would be interesting, actually, to ask people to ask, to ask about the, the precision about what they do. Well, it may contribute to high savings rates, you know, even though. Five minutes. It delayed retirement. Yeah. So I, I have five minutes. Um, you know, so in general, our we don't see uh, much evidence of gradual retirement conditional on working. Um, there's a little bit more in uh, rural areas, and these are agricultural, uh, you know, agricultural workers at older ages may be, um, you know, even though they report large numbers of hours of work, they may. There, there is a, a gradient, but they're working at older ages. You know, so, well, the new, we, we used the Charles to ask the question uh, in the, um, of the NRPP program and, and one of the uh, Beijing University's PhD students. Um, we looked at, uh, you know, the labor supply models show correlations. We said, okay, in some sense, the rollout of China's new rural pension program offered an, exter an experiment. We want to ask whether extending very low uh, social pensions to populations that haven't been covered will lead to a decline in labor force participation or activity, whether it'll be associated with a reduction in, in private transfers um, or, or other possible uh, effects. Um, so there have been a, a policy motivations is one of many policies to try to slowly close the gap between urban and rural formal and informal retirement systems and to add additional protection against poverty and, and old age. So this was a, the NRPP program was a pilot that started in 2009. It enrolled, the aim was to enroll the working age population over age 16, excluding uh, students and individuals covered by uh, urban employee pensions. Um, it's funded by individual contributions and uh, government, local and national government subsidies uh, with individual contributions at different levels. Now, with the phase, it, it, you require generally 15 years of participation to get the minimum benefit of 55 yuan per month at age 60. The, the, the interesting uh, feature for our case is that if individuals are over 60, um, they could receive a benefit already. Originally, there was a real quirk, there was a quirk in the program that required child participation in order to get the benefit. So your child had to be making his own contributions to the pension program in order to provide a benefit uh, for his parent. Um, in practice, they had a very hard time uh, implementing this because it was um, you know, simply hard to deny a payment to someone who had an irresponsible 
child while providing uh, payments to the neighbor. Um, this was rolled out in stages and available every, virtually everywhere as of September 2012. And it's been now merged with a new urban residence pension designed for informal sector workers in, in often you know, long-term migrants in urban areas. So you know, assuming credit constraints, uh, older people, I shouldn't call someone 60 old elderly by any, by any means, but older people on either side of the age threshold for receiving the NRPP may differ in, in preferences uh, for retirement. So we used the 2011-2012 the National Baseline Survey data, uh, and we're in, in the RD estimates, we first restrict the sample to rural communities where the new rural pension program was implemented, and then use the communities where it was not yet implemented as a placebo test. So the, you know, this shows the, you know, the, there wasn't complete participation uh, in places where uh, the pension was, uh, there wasn't 100% enrollment, but there's a, a pretty sharp discontinuity uh, that we um, exploit. So we allow some uh, time for enrollment in the pension, and uh, so the, the, you know, if we look at the dependent variable on the, of receiving pension benefits or not, on uh, whether or not you've crossed an age threshold, there's a, a pretty strong association which we're going to use in a fuzzy, we use in a fuzzy RD design. So we then look at the effects of receiving pen, pension benefits on various outcomes. So uh, if we use a plus and minus uh, five years, but looking at the range from, from age uh, 55 to 65 using the official poverty line, we do see a decline in uh, in probability of being in poverty. So, why do you have such a large benefit? Uh, well, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very small sample. The number of observations. It's not census. It's not census. You, you, you have uh, you have uh, curves, right? Is it work? What's the dependent so, variable? So it's not work. It, it's 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 not work. Oh, I'm not. You, do, do, I thought you fit the polynomial uh, yeah. line outside oh, of the, the discussion. Yes. So it's not group. It's not a group of ten uh, years. No, no, no. We're talking about the. Uh, You're just you no. Know, so Mung's Mung's point is that. People who are 65 have preferences that are very sim and unobservables that are very, very dissimilar from people who are 55. That's what I said. You actually fit polynomials to, yeah. to, uh, to allow for trust. So that's just saying the probability of somebody 65, 60 to 65 is 25% more that they're not working. Yes. Than 55 to 60. How about doing the placebo test? From well, so we've controlled, there's a, there's a, yes, yeah, so the placebo test, so the, the poverty status and the, the probability of retiring does seem to go up. There's a, you know, a very weak association with reduction in private transfers. The placebo test shows no effect. Right, so this is, kind of surprising because it's a very low pension. There's no, um, there's no effect uh, on a range of other possible uh, outcomes. If you look at the difference, in, the, difference, the difference in the communities who have the program, are those richer areas that are better locally funded? I mean, that must. That, oh, yeah, true. You know, so I just can't believe it's that eighty-five, uh, fifty-five yen a month. That's just a basic. That's a basic. Fifty-five yen a month raises. Yeah, yeah. Richer areas they provide more. 
kind of part of the tariff early. Yeah, so I don't know at what so level we at what level we controlled for. I'll have to go back and check at what you know what level we controlled for uh, fixed effects. Um, so, additional results in non-poor communities, there was, uh, there was stronger and more significant effects on reducing depression. If we looked at poor communities, uh, Scott, in looking within poor communities, there's a stronger effect on poverty reduction um, and weakly significant declines in hours worked but not prob probability of retirement. Um, among, if we looked among individuals with physical functioning limitations, there was an increase in out-of-pocket um, outpatient expenditures. Uh, among the, the healthy, you know, looking within just the healthy, there's stronger effects on retirement and reduced probability of receiving uh, transfers. If you also looked at what you might call structural change outcomes, like Know, if there is a change in rental of land, or a change in the migration behavior of children, or a change in migration of elderly, there is absolutely no evidence of a change in any of these um, variables. So again, you might think uh, the low subsidized pension will help to alleviate poverty and reduce vulnerability. Um, there's relatively modest effects on on, on most outcome measures, but we have to remember this reflects that the basic pension of 55 renminbi per month is really quite low. And uh, as people are pointing out, the, the retirement effect seems, seems rather large. Um, but again, even with the modest pension, uh, the results suggest some significant effects on work activity. Um, if you were to think of other uh, institutional changes, changing the age of eligibility, we've heard various uh, stories about the, the, you know, one of the, the, least the least popular things to raise in the Chinese press is to suggest that you should raise the retirement age. So there's, it's, it's very unlikely to see efforts to raise the, the retirement age, the age of eligibility of benefits above age 60. Um, but, you know, again, finding ways to uh, incentivize work regardless of the transition to receiving pensions might be possible. You know, whether, um, and this may happen uh, naturally as like, you know, in the, the, the public opinion surveys we've, we've looked through, uh, talking about attitudes towards raising the retirement age, um, and in the opinions of employers, there's a perception that the people over 50, 55, 60 have very poor human capital. They were educated at a time when, the, when the, they, they didn't have as much education, and they were educated at a time when the education system wasn't functioning very well. The, one might expect that, that the scarcity of labor um, the, in the future will raise uh, possible wage rates for older and more skilled workers. So you know, the, the market, in some sense, might take care of uh, raising the, the, um, the retirement age in urban areas. But that, you know, it's something to possibly watch. In our, in our descriptive uh, explorations of Charles across different regions, we actually see somewhat higher labor force participation among people on, in the east of the country where wages are higher than in the west. So you, know, there's, you, you might believe that, that uh, scarce labor will also spill over into at, at some point into incentives for people to work longer. Okay. Okay, thank you. So. <laughs> I <got that> <laughs>